Welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, tuning in for a follow-up from the open house that we had with Open Medicine Foundation. Here I've got Dr. Ron Tompkins. He's willing to do a f or answer a few of the questions that we received after his talk from the open house. Um, welcome, Ron. Well, thank you, Chris. I'm happy to be here. That's great. Uh, I think uh, people were very interested in a number of things that you're doing and, and a lot, of, especially a lot of your history. I think in particular, there was a lot of interest in regards to your work with injury in specifically the, the Glue Grant project. And I thought maybe we could start there and just ask you if you could give a little bit of more background in regards to what the Glue Grant project was and how it relates to the field of MECFS or how it might relate to the field of MECFS. I'm, uh, I'm happy to uh, respond to that. Um, over the last, uh, uh, beginning about 20 years ago, for 15 years, uh, uh, there was a large scale collaborative project funded through the National Institutes of Health, General Medical Sciences. Uh, the basic question is, how does the human body respond to injuries that are serious enough um, that in 20 to 25 percent of cases, people uh, die. So it's very serious injuries, such as terrible auto accidents or being hit as a pedestrian by a moving vehicle or a bus. And so you can imagine that is a very serious stress. The reason for the disease is long gone by the time the individual uh, is taken to the hospital. So as a doctor to deal with these injuries, um, the cause is gone, but the body's reaction to that terrible stress is just beginning. So the, the way that, that doctors be, deal with um, the response to injuries is to correct many of the anatomic uh, broken bones and other injured organs that can be corrected surgically, but a great deal is dealing with the intensive care and the other medical management and, and uh, response of, the, of a person's body to this terrible insult. And a great deal of that creates metabolic problems as well as immune and inflammatory problems. And over that uh, 15 year period, um, we had included and worked together with, uh, it was 22 academic centers in the United States, one of which was at Stanford with Ron Davis and we were interested uh, working with his group on the genomics of that response. And so I have a long history working with Ron in very complex diseases. Um, over the course of that time period, his son became quite ill. And uh, over the course of the last 20 years, I've learned a lot about um, MECFS just by my relationship with Ron and his terrible saga with uh, Whitney. And at one point we would just compare notes and both of us came to the conclusion that many of the things that he's experiencing in Whitney's illness are things that we are routinely dealing with in this response to injury. In terms of the immunology, the inflammatory response and metabolism. And so we both came to the conclusion, gee, we know quite a bit now about the genomics and the proteomics of this terrible injury and how you begin to recover and how doctors support patients to recover uh, successfully. And we also see those individuals 
who do fail to completely recover. And it's remarkable how many of, of those who fail to recover can resemble patients with ME-CFS. It has the fatigue, it has uh, cognitive brain fog, it has uh, many dysautonomic sleep disorders and pain issues that could be considered indistinguishable from ME-CFS. And in those instances, it's a failure of individual tissues to successfully recover. And so one possibility is that, you know, many instances, ME-CFS follows a terrible infectious issue or other types of stress. But um, in many ways, the failure to completely recover to normal from these terrible stresses might be rather similar to what it is in injury. So that's as short of answer as I can probably provide. I mean, that, that I think is fascinating, especially because, you know, there are a number of different, uh, I mean, a number of different ways of people get triggered with MECFS. And so really, I guess what it sounds like you're doing is emphasizing that uh, the response, I guess, to that injury rather than the injury themselves and maybe an altered response or an anomalous response to that injury, whatever it may have been, may be some of the underlying components to MECFS. Would that be right? Yeah, I would say the, the natural recovery process, and I would say uh, the vast majority recover completely. It may take six or 12 months, but they do fully recover. But there are, there are a number of individuals who even after 12, 18, 24 months still persist with symptoms, many of which could be indistinguishable from ME CFS. But in those instances, uh, as a doctor, you would just say, you just haven't recovered from being hit by a bus. And so there's a reason. Uh, but in the case of ME CFS, you know, there was no bus there. It might have been a, you know, some kind of a viral infection, you know, even just a simple vaccination. But for some reason, they never recovered to normal. And so that's, I mean, how do you think some of this work that you've done in, in understanding injury recovery may help to understand the underlying disease process of MECFS? I think I'm talking more specifically to some of the findings that you found from that, from that Blue Grant project. Um, and what are you thinking may also be found in MECFS because of that? In, um, after injury, there's an amazing inflammatory reaction that uh, involves not only the immune system uh, that requires re fully re full recovery to normal, but inflammatory uh, changes that uh, exist in the gut, in the lungs, in the brain, um, and in many organs. And if those inflammatory reactions um, the immune reactions do not fully recover, then you can have persistent severe symptoms. And yet laboratory tests at that point appear normal, at least standard laboratory tests appear normal. And uh, which is exactly one of the huge problems in ME-CFS, severe symptoms. Um, yet uh, the standard laboratory tests appear normal. And that could easily be attributable to very subtle differences in which tissues have failed to return to complete normalcy. So, I mean, I, obviously you're, you're doing some work now, uh, especially on this work from co the COVID to ME project. Uh, and this sounds like something um, as an opportunity, I guess, that you could also uh, study uh, the, how an injury or perhaps in this case, an infection 
may eventually lead to MECFS. So kind of mimicking what you did with the flu grant with injury, but doing it this time with an infection. Um, any, so, yep. so I, I should add, uh, one of the findings in the clue grant was that early within hours of the injury and certainly over the first two to three days, 80% of human genes uh, become highly regulated. So they respond to the injury either being upregulated or downregulated. And they remain, most of them had different recovery phases. Some return to normal within hours or days, but, and some had never recovered even after a year. But most in, in, in trauma, uh, most, many, I would say two thirds, have recovered to normal by let's say four to six weeks. In burns, they can last for months uh, and remain abnormal as long as patients continue to be uh, sick. And then, so the recoveries are very different for different uh, genes. It is my opinion, which is in a hypothesis that for example, COVID, the SARS-CoV-2, is a very inflammatory virus. And if you became severely ill, requiring hospitalization and intensive care, I suspect that probably most every human gene that could respond, responds in those cases. And, and so then the question would be, is the recovery from that condition the same or different than it would be if you were hit by a bus? In this case, you were hit by a very inflammatory virus. And, and if, you look, if you look in from a, um, a uh, over geological time, there is, there is no evolutionary pressure to indicate that there would be any differences. It's only been the last 50 to 75 years that one could ever be this sick and recover because of modern healthcare. So there were no selection pressures to favor any particular gene response one way or another. So my suspicion is the response will be identical. Any gene that could respond will respond no matter how it occurred. And then you're looking at recovery from what is otherwise a lethal injury. And so uh, you mentioned that uh, these genes are, are being utilized effectively, what they're, what they're doing. They're all responding to this injury, 80%. Um, and some of those stay activated effectively um, for, for a longer period than other people. So in some people, they're longer than others. Does that relate specifically to the length of recovery time? Does that have a relationship at all, do you think, to how those patients then recover need, from the disease? I need to clarify. Um, what, um, there is less difference between individuals. Um, under this kind of condition than there is at rest. Okay. Which is ironic. But at rest, the, my gene expression profile will be more different from yours than it would be if we were both hit by exactly the same bus. Yeah. Honestly, we become more consistent. And so individual genes have their own time scales. And your recovery for each of those genes would be almost identical to mine. Okay. And, um, um, but certainly not everyone in, is going to recover completely to normal. 
And so what you're really looking for are early signs of a, that would be predictive, number one, that you're not likely to ever recover to normal completely in every tissue. And secondarily, which pathways are the ones are likely to fail full recovery? So for both predictive reasons, so that you could try an intervention and it might suggest what kind of intervention might be useful for in the cases where I could predict you're not gonna recover completely and maybe there's a drug or some kind of intervention I could create that would make you more likely to fully recover. So those are the intents. And it basically is the, the early identif identification of those who are at risk to develop ME. And then what pathways might be relevant and, and in those pathways, what interventions might be possible. So in essence, uh, by following up with these, these cases in this COVID ME, the hospitalized cases to determine if some of them get ME, those who effectively did, you'd be interested in looking at some of the potential predictive how markers going on. Yeah, yeah, how they how compare. How do they compare to those who did fully recover? Yeah, and that's uh, obviously the, the, the question that we all probably want to get answered um, as soon as possible. And do you, did you find that any of this research that you worked with on trauma and injury may have led to some of some clues or anything in regard to that? Uh, there are very distinct gene signatures to those who are going to recover uneventfully to those who are going to be, have re complex recoveries. We know those gene signatures uh, backwards and forwards. We spent $100 million understanding that. So we, we know that. And uh, so we're comfortable with, and that's with injury. And we don't know the extent that COVID is different, but we won't ever discover that unless we study it carefully. I mean, and, yeah, it sounds like, I mean, you have yeah, a, a significant knowledge uh, in the field of trauma and injury. Um, and obviously you've talked to me a little bit about treatments as well. Um, what do you hope to accomplish most, I guess, by applying this kind of information to MECFS? And what do you, yeah, what do you see as kind of your main goal here? Well, often um, when you're studying so many different aspects, you find differences. Um, one is to uh, identify which differences actually matter. And if one had an intervention, whether it would actually change the natural course. And, and so you have um, identification of an association that could be predictive. And that's useful because if you could predict that, that failure to fully recover and development of ME is likely, then you get really serious trying any kind of interventions that might be possible. And you might get a clue from those pathways that are predictive. And you know you have to start looking under the light. And we, we know a lot under this light, but we don't know how it is applicable in MECFS. So, um, but it's, in, in my opinion, it has tremendous possibility and opportunity. No, I, I think a lot of people would agree with you on that. Um, and I think that's sort of definitely an area of priority to kind of understand more. Um, thank you very, very much for, for sitting down and, and willing to answer a few of the questions from the open house. We appreciate that very much. We appreciate your work and we're looking forward to seeing what comes out of it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chris. I'm delighted. Um, anytime. Cheers. Thanks, Rob. Bye. Cheers.